Hello, everyone. I'd say take a seat, but. <laughs> Hello. Everyone, everyone, welcome. We're still going to take a couple minutes just to let everyone in, but everyone, hello. Welcome to the Art History Society Spring Symposium Series, Art in Our Lives. This is a biweekly video lecture series scheduled for every other Thursday until the end of spring semester. The theme of this series is to tell you all the many ways that you can be part of the art world. From educators to creators, we hope to highlight these professionals' experiences in order to inspire and instigate the opportunities and capabilities that exist within the art world. And today we have renowned art history professor Genevieve Nicolak, a professor here at our very own Cal State Los Angeles, who specializes in modern and post-war art. She received her PhD from the graduate program in visual and cultural studies at the University of Rochester and her BA from Wesleyan University. Her research eliminates the significance of collective artistic formations to rethink theories of the avant-garde and histories of identity, difference, and relationality in 20th century art. Thank you all for coming so much and welcome to Professor Nicolak. Hi, I'm so pleased to be here. Um, give me one second, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're perfectly fine, don't worry. Uh, right now we're just gonna be uh, waiting one or two minutes to let everyone in. I just thought we uh, start off with the introductions. Thank you all for being here. Hope everything's going okay for everyone. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. I'm extremely honored to be here and uh, it's just uh, really, I appreciate how much work the organizers of the Art Historical Society have put into this symposium and into the organization as a whole. And I'm just uh, so excited about um, what you guys do. So thank you for inviting me to speak um, and just uh, let me know just let me know when you're ready and I'll get started. Hi, Manuel. Hi, uh, hi Professor Aguilar. Oh, I am Manuel. No, no. <laughs> I am Manuel. We, we are colleagues. How, how are you? <laughs> hi, Profe. Glad you're here. Hola. Alegría. How are you? We're good. We're so happy everyone can be here today. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, of course. I, I, I love all the things you, you do, so perfect. We also wanted to preface before uh, Professor Nicolette starts her, her lecture uh, to please keep uh, your video off or minimized and your microphone muted. Uh, and you can type any questions you have out in the chat and we will ask, we'll be asking them later. Uh, during our 15 minute Q&A after her lecture. So everyone is free to type questions in the chat that we can ask Professor Nicolak. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're ready, Professor. Oh, okay, fabulous. So I'll share my screen. Okay, great. So um, once again, I'm so pleased to be here and thank you to the organizers for setting this up. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is um, I do as a professor of art history. And then I will go back through my training a bit um, because I think I took a kind of circuitous path to, to get here, um, which might be a little bit interesting, um, especially for those of you who are looking into various types of careers in the arts. Um, and then I think I'll end up by talking a little bit about my research, my current book project and some things I have planned in the future. And then maybe the question of, of what it is uh, we do, what we do and, 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 and that kind of thing. Okay, so I actually started, okay, so uh, I think the, the job description is sort of tripartite, right? 
teaching, research, and service. Um, and I won't talk too much about teaching because I think that that's the thing that's probably already very clear to you. Um, but I will talk a little bit about my research and about, and what I'll say about service is that um, this is an important part of the job um, because of the importance of shared governance within the university that we, the faculty, um, acting in dialogue with the interests of the students have a, have a say in what happens and why, right? This is really, really important. And so that's a big part of, of, of the job. Um, and this also means service to the profession. So for example, I serve as a reviewer for a peer reviewer for a couple of different journals. Um, and I'm active in some professional organizations. Um, and then, uh, so that relates to, to research. And I'll, I'll kind of talk about what my research is about. Um, but I will also say on a more practical level, like right now, I, I've actually been on Zoom all day because I've been attending the College Art Association's annual conference, which is the sort of largest uh, association within the US for um, art historians, for artists, for museum professionals. And so usually this is held in a big hotel in LA or New York, sometimes in Chicago, and you sort of go to these long two hour panels all day and, and ask questions. Um, but it's it's actually very exciting. You, you learn about what are the newest things happening in the field? Um, what are people working on? What kinds of arguments are they making? you have a chance to give people feedback or if you're presenting to receive feedback um, and and that kind of thing and so I'll be uh, presenting a little bit from my current book project uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m um, but I've had a really I was a little uh, unsure about how the how the online format would work because a lot of it is about sort of in-person exchanges um, but it's it's been okay so I've had a really inspiring conference um, and one in which I've also uh, learned a lot uh, pedagogically about um, uh, things like diversifying the curriculum, how to include a more global perspective, um, various strategies that other professors are using to cope with our current conditions um, during this pandemic. And so it's also a really helpful exchange of information around uh, pedagogy and, and the things we do as teachers. Okay, so that's kind of the job description. Um, and now I, I'm gonna talk about my formation and then about my research. Um, so I took a very circuitous path to becoming an art historian. I started uh, my undergraduate degree thinking that I wanted to study astronomy and physics. And I spent a lot of time studying astronomy and physics. And then uh, for various reasons, I changed my mind and ended up being a double major in sociology and what was then women's studies, but while I was there was changed to feminist gender and sexuality studies. Um, so I did take a lot of art history classes as an undergrad, but I was not an art history major. Um, but in a way, I was already working through these ideas. Um, so my first semester as a freshman, I took a class on the European avant-garde. Um, and it was a really interesting class with uh, Professor Catherine Coonsley, who's a wonderful scholar of the Nabi, a kind of uh, symbolist group in the late 19th century. And for her class, I wrote a paper on uh, Vasily Kandinsky's Several Circles, um, which is to this day, one of my favorite paintings. It lives at the Guggenheim. Um, and I was really interested uh, as someone who was interested in, in science and astronomy specifically, I was interested in how Kandinsky's painting reflected his engagement, uh, which was, of of course sort of eccentric and idiosyncratic with the scientific theories of his day and with like the discovery of, of, of um, sort of the most interesting challenging scientific ideas and so I was looking at art history from that lens um, and then I wrote a honors thesis uh, that dealt with anatomical atlases, Renaissance anatomical atlases, and spatial metaphors within postmodern theory. Um, and so this was an interesting project and one that I probably will never pick back up, but it was really exciting. And I had a chance um, to 
begin to get a sense of what research was. Um, so I went to the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale, which was near uh, which was sort of near to my campus. And I was able to look at, you know, like 16th century anatomical atlases and, and understand them as material objects, which was just really, really astounding to, to touch something that, that old, you know, uh, with someone watching over me in like white gloves and everything. Um, and so that kind of gave me a taste for what, what working with, with uh, primary materials might be like. After college, I worked in an art gallery for four years um, as, as an assistant and then later in some other roles. And uh, during that time, I realized I wanted to be an art historian because, well, first there was the economic crisis. So about one year into my first job, um, our economic system more or less fell apart um, and that was difficult. And also I found that in my spare time, I was reading academic books. And at a certain point, I think it's really important actually maybe to try doing something else because there are a lot of things about uh, the, the, the academy that are quite difficult. Um, but I, I found that in my spare time, that's what I was doing. And so obviously that was the thing that I loved and needed to, to keep doing. Um, so while, okay. And while I was there, I also, um, Oh, I should, I should briefly say, sorry, um, I should briefly say during the end of college and before I got this job at the gallery, I held several internships at the Whitney Museum, at the Zilke Gallery, which was my university's art gallery, and then at the Guggenheim. And, uh, you know, I'm always available um, to answer questions about the ins and outs of doing art world internships. There are definitely benefits and there are, all, are also things about them that are quite imperfect. Um, I did a lot of data entry. <laughs> Right, but it was um, it helped me, I think, get my foot in the door to work at a gallery. Um, and I also had some interesting experiences. So I was interning at the Whitney's library and sorting through old curatorial binders where I discovered the sort of fabulous images of the um, early 20th century sculptor Louise Nevelson, who you can see in the lower left hand corner. And she would just pose for these really wonderful photographs with her like kind of uh, extended eyelashes and these really outra costumes. Um, uh, at Zilka, I worked with um, the curator there, Nina Felshin, who uh, influenced me a lot. She had dug up some slides from the 70s that she had collected of, of feminist art. Um, and this was stuff that had, had only begun to be sort of published and understood. And so I was able to like look at these really interesting artifacts of these slides, which we don't have anymore, but um, we, we still did at that point. And so I was able to look at this uh, sort of snapshot into art history before it had sort Sort of been written into books. So this kind of like raw material. Um, and then at the Guggenheim, I interned at the conservation department. Also, what I did was data entry, but um, I, there was an interesting experience there too, which was the um, AXA insurance company had donated a Ad Reinhardt black painting. So that's um, kind of over here that had been damaged so badly that it was considered to no longer be art. And that was interesting because um, with art, things that are considered to be art, um, at least in the US, and I think this is probably the case in, in a lot of places, the professional ethics are basically do no harm. You're only allowed to do things that are reversible in order to conserve um, artworks. And so it's a very minimal approach. Uh, but because this painting had been so badly damaged, um, they were able to do all kinds of things that they would usually not be allowed to do to an artwork. And so they would, they could, you know, do all sorts of interesting scientific um, types of imaging and like dig into it and things like that. And they were able to learn so much about the pigment and the application and develop treatments for other Reinhardt paintings that were still art. Um, so they, it was really, so it was, it was a kind of fascinating situation. And it was also really interesting because I spent this whole summer, you know, sitting at a computer. Um, and then in a room next to me is this, this darkened room and inside of it, there's this black painting that's essentially like a corpse, like this painting that, um, you know, <laughs> is like shrouded in darkness that they're using in order to essentially like uh, understand the 
anatomy of an Ad Reinhardt painting in order to sort of heal and treat the paintings that are still out there in the world. Um, I mean, interestingly, when Reinhardt was still alive, the surfaces are quite delicate. And so if, uh, if one got messed up, he would simply tell the collector or museum to bring it back to him and he would fix it. But that's not something um, museum professionals can do. So it was a really interesting moment to also understand that an art object is this material, fragile, thing that needs to be cared for. Um, and that even though we often think about art, especially after like the 18th century as this autonomous, um, timeless, transcendent kind of thing, uh, in reality, these are material objects that, that age just like anything else. I mean, painting will last a very long time if it's done correctly, um, but like everything else, it's, it's sort of mortal in a sense, um, at least if it's not kept under the most ideal of circumstances. And so that was a kind of interesting, I think, informative experience. Um, so anyway, I, I, I went to work for a gallery for four years, found I didn't much uh, find selling art to be interesting, um, although I think a lot of people do. Uh, and at the time, I also volunteered with the time-based arts festival that the Portland Institute of Contemporary Art did. And so for about two weeks each year, I would like volunteer as a gallery sitter, or later on, I did some writing for them. And then I would get to go to uh, just nonstop performances, about three performances every day, like Barishnikov came and, um, and things like that. One of my favorites was the artist Miguel Gutierrez, um, who did a piece called Last Meadow there that was that was really memorable. Um, and so I was able to be exposed to a lot of, of, of interesting performances, really cutting edge stuff. And I would just jump into it for two weeks each year. And I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed that. So uh, in 2000 and 10, I applied to graduate schools and I ended up going to uh, the University of Rochester's PhD program in visual and cultural studies, where I worked um, with uh, Douglas Crimp as my advisor. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about Douglas, who sadly passed away last year. I guess a year and a half um, ago now. Uh, and so Douglas was a really fantastic mentor and had been really important to the creation of this program. And so uh, visual and cultural studies is sort of like art history, but also very, especially theoretically informed um, and also involved in the studies of things that aren't usually grouped under the fine arts, at least in a modern sense. Um, and so you have a lot of people interested in film and film studies, uh, video games, all kinds of um, image making and cultural production uh, that might relate to art or it might not, but there's a certain kind of skill set uh, that can be used to understand it. Um, it has a kind of history uh, within the academy. It was very kind of controversial for a while, um, but by the time I arrived, um, it was it, it was kind of like an art history program that really focused on uh, contemporary and and sort of late twentieth century work, um, often in a sort of global perspective. Um, and so uh, Douglas had initially. Uh, gained a reputation for his work with the journal October and for penning a couple of really important articles in the late 70s that helped to define um, postmodernism within the arts um, and the practice of appropriation and what he called pictures art. Uh, and so he was he was an editor of October for about 20 years. Um, and then he became very active in um, activism around the AIDS crisis in the 80s um, and wrote a lot of really, really influential and important books um, during that time and was, uh, was active in groups like ACT UP, um, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, and then he kind of had to step back from that and focused on his work as a teacher at the graduate program at Rochester. Um, and so while I was there, he was working on two books that, that came out shortly, um, that came out uh, around that time. So the first was a book on Warhol's films. Um, and so Warhol's films had been sort of, uh, 
impossible to see for a very long time. Um, and so they hadn't made a big impact on scholarship. Um, and there were also various disciplinary reasons that people might not have included them in their picture of Warhol. Um, and the picture of Warhol that you get from the films is a really different one than the one that you get from his extremely expensive um, paintings. Uh, and so I, I, I bring this up just to give you a kind of sense of like what it was like what graduate school um, was like in the sense. So as Douglas was working on this book, he had a seminar on Warhol and we read, you know, together all, you know, not all of the scholarship, but a lot of the scholarship on Warhol. And so it was a really helpful sort of behind the scenes look at what it means to really, really dive into the subject, you know, to understand everything that's been said about it or most things that have been said about it and to formulate your intervention, the kind of uh, care and rigor that goes into doing that and the ways in which you can kind of begin to formulate your own position. So that was really um, educational for me um, to kind of see that process as I was learning how to do it myself. Uh, and then I also served as a research assistant for Douglas's memoir, Before Pictures, which looked at his life before curating the pictures exhibition in 1977, and was specifically interested in how his sort of participation in gay worlds in the um, 70s um, and in art worlds in the 70s were sort of bifurcated um, and how it, it was sort of an experimental memoir to think about how these two uh, these two realms did or didn't meet. Um, and this was also really educational because uh, we had to go, even though this was a memoir, we had to go and dig up all of these photos. We had to fact check all of this information. Um, you know, there's this kind of precision and rigor uh, that Douglas modeled. And um, so I was like running around learning all kinds of of like, you know, I, I had to find out what was the first Moroccan cookbook that was was published in English. I had to get a film still of a particular, um, you know, uh, Italian neorealist movie, you know, so it was just also a really good lesson in how to do research and secure image permissions and all of these other kinds of of day to day things, while also not losing sight of um, the way in which uh, the way in which as scholars, we are connected to our work, right? Even if what we're doing might seem to have nothing to do with us. Like a lot of my research has very little to do, at least on the surface with who I seem to be as a person. Um, but that, you know, our kind of biography and our investments and commitments are, are there. And so that was sort of a important moment, I think for me. Um, and so uh, the other thing I did while I was in grad school, and this was because Douglas was working on uh, a lot of work on contemporary dance. Um, so we did a seminar in dance, and then I would go with him and some of my other colleagues to see all kinds of dances. Like we'd go to the Cunningham studios and see their kind of like weekly rehearsals. Uh, so fabulous Anna Teresa de Kiersmacher performance, um, just lots and lots of things. And at the time in the art world in New York, where I was going back and forth, uh, there was a really big wave of, of dances being performed in the museum. And so uh, I became really interested in like why this was happening. And I wrote a term paper on uh, the phenomenon of dance in the museum and specifically on the Merce Cunningham Dance Company's performances in museums um, across Europe uh, beginning in 1964. And I wanted to try to understand how in that context dance was coming to stand for a kind of democratization of the institution, but one that was in many ways quite superficial. Um, and so I developed an, uh, from, from that research paper, which I was, I was lucky enough to be able to go while I was writing it back in 2012 to the New York Public Library, which has a really important dance collection. And David Vaughn, who was the company's uh, sort of in-house archivist um, during uh, the 50s and 60s, and I think until the, the company disbanded, um, although I, I would have to double check that, so don't quote me on that. Um, he, he would 
sort of sit and hold court uh, once a week at, at the, the archive. And so I made an appointment with him and I was able to talk to him about all of the questions I had about the company that I couldn't figure out. Uh, I was able to go through the library's collection of um, you know playbills and notes and all kinds of archival material from the show. And then I had to um, you know find ways to contact the museums and uh, learn about why it was that they were inviting dancers to, to to come and perform within places that had previously only held visual art. Um, and this was actually really interesting, like dance at various moments, uh, much earlier than the 60s, had been an important part of museums, but it would usually be held in a theater or in the garden or in some sort of ancillary space. Uh, but in this sort of moment in the mid 60s and Cunningham, uh, especially dance was now being held actually where you would usually look at a sculpture or a painting. Um, and so uh, here's the thing about academic publishing. Um, while I wrote this paper in 2012 and started submitting it um, to for peer review, you know, presenting on it, I, I presented in Basel, Switzerland, which was really fun. Um, and uh, submitting it to journals, it didn't actually see the light of day until the winter of 2019 um, for various reasons. Uh, I see a chat, one second. Um, okay, and so let's see. I wanna talk a little bit more about graduate school since I know this is something some of you are involved in currently or might be thinking about in the future. Um, so I did two other things during graduate school. Um, once I finished my coursework, I participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program, um, which is a really interesting institution that's been around and run by the same person, a man named Ron Clark, um, since 1968. Um, and it's still happening and Ron still runs it, although I think they had to suspend their operations this year. And the in Independent Study Program brings a group of, I think, four, or six critics, which are usually um, working people in graduate school for art history, a, a small group of curators and a group of artists. Um, and the, the critical studies component um, finishes the, the year with a symposium, the curators put on an exhibition and the artists um, have a show and are developing their work in the studio. And uh, during the year I was doing the independent study program, we would meet twice a week and, uh, Ron invites a sort of really amazing um, group of, of philosophers and thinkers and art historians and artists to, um, okay, uh, to, to give presentations to the students um, and give us a chance for, for questions and answers. And it was really just an education in a lot of the discourses that had shaped the art world since the late 60s um, and a, a kind of time to really just think um, surrounded by this really unique um, group of, 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 of sort of committed people. Um, so I did that. Um, and then shortly after that, as I was beginning to write my dissertation, I was lucky enough to get, I was lucky enough to get a fellowship um, through the French embassy to go to France for a year to do my research, which was absolutely crucial um, because I needed to talk to a lot of the artists that were still alive that I had decided to work on for my um, for my dissertation and there were a lot of archival materials that I could only see there and there was a lot of art that I could only see there. In fact, I had landed on the subject because I saw um, when I first learned about this group of artists that I would later write about, they just blew my mind. I was like, this makes no sense. These don't fit into art history as I've learned it, as I currently understand it. Um, it, it, was, it was just totally foreign to me. And I wanted to understand like what it was about. Um, and so I, I was very lucky to be able to go and um, I'm just showing some, some pictures. Uh, up here is the library of the uh, Ian Asha, which is the Institute for Art History and it's just the most gorgeous library and I would go there 
to, to, to read and write every day. It was like a walk from, from my apartment. And uh, it was a lesson in the French bureaucracy. You can see my reading cards for that library and for the modern library at the Pompidou. Um, I was also able to get a, a card that let me go to the Louvre whenever I wanted. So I would go a couple of times of uh, a couple of times a week for, you know, after I paid the small fee and then I could go whenever I want, basically skip the line. And it was just fabulous. You know, people would be lining up to see the Mona Lisa and I would sort of sneak behind them and go look at like 18th century French painting or something that was uh, not so popular. And I didn't have to spend five hours there. You know, you'd go for like 20 minutes and then go get dinner. It was just amazing. Um, and then this is the, uh, a really interesting organization um, in the north of France called EMAC. Uh, I can't, I, I don't remember offhand what that stands for, but they hold a lot of papers of um, French and, and uh, Francophone writers and philosophers. Um, and a couple of the people I wanted to work on in my dissertation had papers that were stored there. And so I took this trip um, and I <laughs> wanted to include this because it was, um, it was actually this like monastery, I think, uh, that had been converted into this archive. And it was so amazing. You, I went there for a couple of days and they put you up and you had meals, like home cooked meals with like their special wine, um, with like other scholars who were there to access the archives. You'd like sit around and eat dinner with them and eat lunch with them. And it was like the best food somehow. Um, and then you'd go and sit in this former monastery looking at the material, you know, as like the, the sort of stained glass windows, the lights pouring down. Like this is kind of like what monks used to do, um, you know, like, uh, but now had been converted into a, a scholarly center and it was just the most magical couple of days. Um, I hope to get back there soon. Um, so that was really fun. And then I'll also say in addition to the, and this is one of the things that's great about uh, art history um, and I'm sure Manuel will agree with me is you have potentially a chance to, to travel and to travel in really unique ways. And so while I was doing all of this serious stuff, I just also like had a blast. Like this is the view from my apartment. Like you'd go on walks and you'd see, oh, what well, you know, this, this writer I really cared about, um, uh, Hoismans in this case, like lived here. Um, I went to every museum. This is a collection at one of the more obscure museums of, of, of statues whose heads had been removed. Uh, um, delicious food. Uh, here I am in Venice for the Biennale. Um, here is the view from Set, a small fishing village that one of the artists I was working on lived in. And so I went to visit him to interview him. And we, you know, this is where we interviewed. So it was, it was really um, a spectacular opportunity and one that I certainly hadn't had before and may well never have again. So it was just such an exciting um, time to develop a project, but also to to get to see at least one part of the world. Uh, so the other thing is, um, so my program, and I think this is an important thing to know, is that uh, PhD programs, uh, um, in general, like you want to look for ones that are funded. This is different um, in many respects from a master's program, but uh, generally the kind of baseline for PhD funding is a five-year um, situation. Um, I didn't have summer funding, like our program um, was funded, but not terribly generously at the time. And so I had to take on a lot of odd jobs in order to support myself during the summer. And so I took on lots of like all kinds of crazy jobs. Like I, one of the main things I did for money was my father is a stained glass artisan. He, um, before he retired, he had a stained glass studio in Brooklyn. And so I would work there um, in the summers uh, making stained glass windows, like tracing them out, cutting the patterns, tracing the patterns onto glass, basically everything you can do until like it becomes a little bit dangerous. Um, I worked for a food bank helping to create promotional materials for a program that they ran introducing um, sort of healthy cooking into food deserts. Um, I worked for uh, as a mail clerk for a um, for a 
thing that's called a home office, which is if you're rich and famous enough, you don't want your bills sent to your, your own office. They get sent to this other thing called a home office. And then a team of like accountants deals with it. Um, because we're being recording recorded, I don't think I can say, I, I'm pretty sure I signed something uh, where I can't say who, who the famous people were, but you can ask me later. It's hilarious. Um, so I had all of these sort of odd jobs, um, but then I was also lucky enough to get some writing jobs during the time to support myself. And so I worked with Lynn Cook on the exhibition Outliers and American Vanguard Art writing artist biographies. Um, and the show, fabulous show was at LACMA. I did a similar thing for a big Luke Toyman's show. Um, I also had the opportunity to work as a research assistant for the writer Hilton Owls, um, doing research at the New York, uh, New York University's Fales Library and Archive on um, uh, on the artist Christopher Knowles for an exhibition, I think in Philadelphia. Um, and so it took me a little while, uh, especially because during the summers I had to, I had to work. I didn't get to just sit around and write. Uh, but eventually I, in 2017, I handed in my dissertation and here's an image of, of when I printed it out to uh, mail from California where I had already moved um, to my, my readers, my committee. And it was a, it was a thick one. Um, and so this brings me to my research and it, I think I have about 15 minutes left. So that should kind of work. Um, so based on my dissertation, I'm currently right, working on a book project uh, that has a slightly different name and it's a slightly different shape. It's called The Ends of the Avant-Garde Painting and Politics circa 1968. I have a typo in this title, I suppose. Um, and I have already published, uh, based on my initial dissertation research, which I have since developed, I've published two pieces from from this, the first uh, supports their schism and the structure of the avant-garde in the journal for the art history, the Association for Art History in the UK um, for their journal. And then uh, another article uh, also based on my second chapter in a special issue dedicated to this question of painting after 1968 in a new journal um, by a sort of younger generation of art historians uh, called Selva. Um, and so these both recently came out um, this past year or so. Um, and I thought I would talk about the project for the rest of my time and maybe a little bit about a new project I'm working on. Um, so this project started because I was interested in what seemed like a kind of paradox. Uh, during the events of May, June 1968, which was um, the sort of largest general strike in modern French history, uh, collectivity was central. Um, whether it be the occupied Sorbonne that we see here, or the workshops of the Atelier Populaire, or the sort of pop, uh, sort of like popular um, workshops, uh, which um, students occupied their art schools and created these really graphically interesting posters that were essentially uh, trying to say, you know, like, let's let the strike continue, like keep going. Um, and so they worked uh, together in this sort of collective workshop um, in order to, to create these works. And so, 68 was interesting for a lot of reasons. I mean, like the, you know, de Gaulle like fled at a certain point, like people thought there was going to be a revolution, right? France has this revolutionary tradition. It certainly wouldn't be the first time, um, but then it kind of fizzled out. And so we, we could get into to why, but that's probably not appropriate for the moment. Um, but my question was, so if collective action was central to this moment, like the ability to occupy the Sorbonne, to occupy factories, to organize wildcat strikes, to create a poster workshop where people worked collaboratively instead of individually, um, why is it that one of the things that comes out of 68 and its aftermath is a kind of indifference to questions of collectivity within um, art histories of the period. Um, and so one of the things that happens is sort of during and after 68, people become interested in the idea of the avant-garde um, and it had been during the mid, the sort of mid century, it had really been depoliticized as a concept um, under sort of like Greenbergian modernism. Uh, and in around 60s, 
around 68 and right up through the, the late 70s, there's a wave of historiographic and theoretical reflection on the avant-garde that on the one hand repoliticized it. So uh, insisted on the ways in which uh, Dada or um, Russian constructivism um, was really wrapped up in the kind of revolutionary currents of its time, um, but at the same time, was totally uninterested in the kind of collective form that was taken up by a lot of avant-garde groups. Um, and so critics like Peter Berger, who, who were really influential in defining the field, really um, talk about you know, the avant-garde as a kind of mixing of art and life, um, or a, a sort of defeat of the autonomy of the art object. And this is of course all true, but I think what's interesting is like, you know, the surrealists modeled themselves after the Leninist party. You know, it was like a cell where people could be like excluded if they didn't get with the party line. Um, and this was the basis for how they interacted with the PCF, the French Communist Party. Uh, you know, there are sort of interesting exchanges between the surrealists um, and uh, representatives of Mexican muralism that's that's triangulated through these questions. Um, and Dada is a more difficult case because they're so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very, irrational and everything, but one of the thing, but they're, they're also very much involved in the kind of groupness of the cabaret. And I think this is the case of a lot of the avant-garde and this really drops out of the discourse that comes out of the 68 moment. And I thought this was really, really interesting, right? With 68, you have this moment in which the sort of power of collective political agency in the form of an occupation or a strike or a collaborative workshop is really seen. Um, but then because of the way in which people became delusional and because of the way that power was, you know, really quickly and brutally restored, um, this sense of politics as collective agency is, we really lose that. Um, and, and as a correlation, I think the theory of the avant-garde that we get from that moment, and this is a kind of argument I'm making, uh, is, is one that has a kind of constitutive absence, like this structuring, this, this, this absence that through its very kind of status of being missing, like shapes the whole discourse. And so this is kind of the big questions I was interested in. And the archive I wanted to look at to understand this is artists who were active during the, the period of, of um, the moment right before 68 and then, and then afterwards, um, because they formed groups. And this is really interesting because uh, they formed groups and they were interested in painting. And that's really weird, right? Because painting is like usually considered to be a very individualistic sort of bourgeois uh, undertaking, right? Like this is the critique that muralism has, I think, of painting. This is the critique that the poster workshop has of painting. Um, you know, it's a very individualized medium in, on some level. Uh, but the artists that I'm looking at formed groups and made paintings. And this makes no sense because for a lot of um, art history, especially uh, pegged to a kind of a US model, like painting is dead in the 60s. It's a completely uh, dead medium. And if you're doing something interesting and certainly something politically engaged, you would not make a painting. Um, and moreover, like there aren't a lot of groups active in the US. Um, and I think this is especially where, where global art history is interesting because there are a lot of groups active in other places. And so I'm really interested in those connections. Um, so anyway, I look at uh, a couple of different groups at moments throughout the 60s um, and how they inhabited their groupness and how what that might tell us about like what it means to conceive of a group, not just in art, but like also um, in politics, also in like militancy or organizing at that time. Um, and I think in a weird way, uh, really through this figure of the avant-garde, which is on its sort of last legs in this moment, there's an interesting connection between art and politics politics specifically through the way in which there's a desire to be in a group, to be part of a group, but also a kind of great difficulty that's posed. Um, so the first group I look at is active in 67. Um, 
uh, Biren, Mosse, Parmentier, and Toroni, uh, who were known in the press as Bampete. Um, and this is this kind of like all of the militant groups, all of the parties, you know, they all have these acronyms. And so they were assigned to this acronym, although they insisted that they weren't a group. You know, they're like, we're not a group. We're certainly not Bampete. Like we are Buren, Par uh, Mosse, Parmentier, and Toroni. Um, but you can see like in this picture that they, they did for a spot on French television in November of 1967, they very much present themselves as a group. And so in this chapter, I wanted to try to understand like why they would pose as a group in this very specific way. I mean, they look like a rock band or a terrorist cell. Like it's, uh, They pose as a group in a certain way and yet they deny it. Um, and so I look on the one hand at how other kinds of groups, especially the groups that were active in the uh, schools that would um, in the schools that were occupied by students during 68, um, which were these very anti-hierarchical, anti-authoritarian groups who were really suspicious of operations of delegation and representation and all of these things. They wanted something more immediate. Um, so I look at how Bam Bam Pete positions itself in relation to those kinds of groups, like the movement of March 22nd, um, uh, and on the one hand. And then on the other hand, I try to think about how their paintings can be understood as a sort of mode of coming together. And so they make these paintings that are like incredibly neutral looking, that try to neutralize the hand of the artist to reduce it to something that um, anyone could do or you could exchange, almost like a machine did it. Um, and that this erasure of their own self is a way for them to come together as a group, for them to kind of make these paintings that they understand to be equivalent. Um, so that, that was sort of my interest in that chapter. And I'll talk about the other chapters a little bit more quickly. Um, I look next at a group uh, called Support Surface that was active um, in the early 70s in France um, and who are also interested in a kind of deconstruction of painting. Um, and so in a really vulgar way, um, on the one hand, they were interested in the support of painting, right? Like the, the stretcher bar is made out of wood and they would sometimes really generalize this to think about like twigs or branches or other kinds of supports um, on the one hand, and then surface on the other hand. So, uh, you know, the canvas, the weave of the canvas, it's similarity to like a fishing net or something like that. And so they wanted to deconstruct painting um, but they wanted to do it in this sort of collective way. And again, there's this way in which they want to erase their own intentionality. They want to erase their own expressivity. Um, all of these things that are tokens within painting of the personal, of the individual, in order to uh, sort of establish themselves as a group um, and also to conduct the, what they understood to be a kind of like scientific deconstruction of painting. Um, and they, you know, within like, a year were you know at, at each other's throats and were um really uh they, they, it broke down really spectacularly into a kind of schism where they were accusing each other of all sorts of sort of political missteps. And this speaks to the kind of politicized moment of the time um, where a lot of them identified uh, as Maoists, um, sort of understanding the role that they felt that the Chinese Communist Party had taken over in uh, representing um, the sort of politics that they wanted to believe were still possible. And so they had a very, very strange and in many ways um, ill-informed uh, understanding of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and so, uh, so with this chapter, I look at how the group uh, sort of mimicked certain aspects of the Maoist groups that had actually pro proliferated in France at the time. Like you can look at uh, Godard's film La, Ch La Chinoise, for example, um, but there was a huge um, flourishing of, of these sort of Maoist militant groups that I compare support surfaces sort of structure to uh, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, the way in which they try to live this out through these really austere paintings. Um, and then finally, at the end of the 70s, I look at a group called Jana Pa, um, who are, mu are much more tenuously a group. This is a moment in which if militant activity had really um, blossomed um, right before and after 68. And, you know, really people thought right until about 1972 that that really radical change was still possible. Um, after that, you have this kind of shedding 
of uh, political hopes. And you have the development of an embrace of, of, of Soviet dissidents. You have this anti-totalitarian discourse. You have the developments of a human rights discourse. And so all of these are essentially renunciations of the previously um, Marxist horizon of, of French politics and French intellectual and artistic life, uh, which is quite different from um, the situation in the US at the time. Uh, uh, and what would eventually by the 80s be a kind of um, individualism. And so here I look at how at the end of the decade, this group uh, still like has some kind of desire to be a group, um, but it sort of is more and more tenuous and is um, in you can kind of read it in terms of the doubts that people begin to have about um, collective politics by the end of this period. Um, and so, you know, this might sound like a really sort of specialized set of, of concerns. I mean, these are artists that don't, um, for the most part, have really big reputations. Um, but what I, what drew me to this um, is, is the idea that the group form um, in art, as much as in any other domain, really marks out the limits of our political imagination. And so that's kind of my gambit is that this is important. And I see that I am almost out of time, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, and I, you know, the question I have, and this is one that comes out of the present moment, is like, how do we understand the composition and agency of, of a class, of a party, um, of a movement, right? Like these are really important questions today. Um, and then also like, how do we understand the kinds of you know, relationships that we have in our lives? Like the kinds of sociality and relationality and groups that we understand and live our own lives through. Um, and, and I think for me, while this is a very, small and, and quite provincial case in a certain way, it helps bring something into view, which is um, which is this thing I want to call the group form and understand as the group form for art history, um, that we can kind of see uh, as a uh, we can see the ways in which the structures of collectivity shift um, and can learn to recognize that this is what politics are, like how people come together, how they organize themselves to a certain end. So it's a way of, of um, sort of learning how, reminding ourselves and learning how to read those structures of collective agency. Um, so I don't have time to talk about my next project, which is going to be about the sort of death of that idea of collective agency with the rise of um, neoliberalism and a kind of individualist ethos in the early 80s. Um, but I wanted to sort of end with a question that the organizers put to me, which was kind of like, why? So why do you, you know, um, what was it? Like, why are the arts important to you? And this is the thing that's complicated. I think like during, especially during the current moment of, of, of quarantine and the pandemic, I, I think the arts have never been more important to me. Like on the one hand, it's like, you know, it's, you know, like there's so many more important things and more urgent things to worry about. Um, but I've, I've never been more invested in like what I can get out of literature of music like of what i used to be able to get out of, of seeing art you know like what a part it is of being human and the good life and and the kind of uh yeah how it can teach you to be a person right like how it can contribute to your quality of life and this is like a sort of really vague humanist idea but it's become very clear to me um when you strip away everything else that remains important um but as an art historian i think sometimes i'm attracted more to bad objects not to the objects that give me sustenance but to the objects that kind of stick in a certain way or don't feel right or are kind of like irritating or wrong, or I don't like that much, um, because I want, you know, f as a scholar, I think, and this is a real split for me, I want to understand I want to look for things that are going to help me understand the world and help me understand the possibilities for how it might be different. Um, and so, you know, this my first project that I'm, I'm kind of wrapping up right now was trying to understand, like, what is collective political agency? What is it like? Why is it important? What happened to it? Um, and the project I'm working on now is trying to, like, understand, like, how is it that we've been left with this this situation in which collectivity is like a distant dream, right? Like where people can't even imagine 
imagine wearing masks to help other people be, be safe, right? Um, and so I think that art, among other things, can just help us understand, you know, sometimes from a really oblique angle, um, these these really crucial problems that might at first seem like they have nothing to do with art. So I'll, I'll stop my screen and I'm only like four minutes over, I'm sorry. <laughs> Never be sorry, thank you so much. That was really amazing. Thank you so much for presenting that to us. Your work and your personage has always been very wonderful and very, oh my gosh. So much great information. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. That was really great. Thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting. Absolutely. We actually have, uh, we already have a question for you. Uh, Gary from uh, the Zoom chat earlier, he wanted to clarify and ask, didn't the Dada movement include dance as a form of art? Oh, absolutely. Right. There's a thank you. That's a great question. Um, yeah, right. So there's a long history, um, especially with something like Dada of, of kind of multidisciplinary uh, forms. But, you know, Dada wasn't really in a museum when it was doing that. Right. <laughs> so this is kind of about this. Um, this later moment where art has been absorbed. You know, Dada was kind of in a sense about breaking down the separation between art and life, um, between the museum um, and, and what happens at like the Cabaret Voltaire or whatever. Um, and so, uh, so I think, yeah, absolutely. But this is a moment in which there's like a twist on that in which uh, Dada has actually in the sixties been institutionalized, right? It's become the art of the museum, right? Like somebody makes a replica of Duchamp's fountain so that it can be shown in the museum. Um, and so then dance comes in uh, as maybe this like remainder of, of some of that radicality. Yeah. Awesome. Go ahead, Gary. I thought you were going to ask something. No, no. I was just, uh, you know, the, the 68 movement sounds like Dada. Dada was more of a Marxist movement, whereas the 68 sounds like it was a Maoist movement. They're both, they're both collective movements, though. And it just, there's a big similarity. It seems like there's a similarity between the two movements. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is uh, one of the things that is really unique about 68 and captures people's imagination is, you know, surrealist slogans um, start showing up like graffitied on the walls. Um, and there's this very sort of poetic element that accompanies like the working class militancy that's also happening. <laughs> um, and so I think that these things are totally uh, wrapped up in each other in that moment. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you for your question, Gary. I see Gabrielle also has a question. Go for it, Gabrielle. Yes, thank you so much for, for the lovely uh, conversation. Uh, my question is, is did you have, um, did you have, did having all the, the, these odd jobs, you know, that you're talking about, did they, did they inspire in any way your interest in art? I mean, sometimes we get into these jobs and we don't know that they might, you know, at some point they could inspire. So did you have that? Uh, happened to you while you were doing all these different jobs? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think like sometimes like from, from Hilton Owls and from Lynn Cook, I learned a lot about what it is to be a thoughtful writer or a thoughtful scholar. And so that was very inspiring. Um, but I think the rest were often in a negative way. Like, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> Like working at a food bank at the food bank, like really um, helped me understand like certain parts of the inequalities in our society that I maybe hadn't had a firsthand view of. And working at the home office helped me see the other end, which I had also not had a view of. Right, like the ext extremities of of rich and poor uh, in the kind of post two thousand and eight moments. And I think that in a sort of roundabout way, I'm sure that informed the route that my studies eventually took, um, right? Because we can't help but be formed um, by the conditions that we find ourselves in, whether or not we understand those conditions, recognize them, uh, recognize it at the time, right? Like we're in dialogue with them. And I think that that was sort of the material conditions of my intellectual production. Thank you so much for your answer and your question. We actually have a, a, a a similar question in that vein about jobs from Jasmine in the chat. Uh, they ask, can you elaborate a little bit on how you were able to keep connected or not lose sight of the connection of your work 
to who you were a while doing a lot, like while you were doing that, you're doing a lot of research jobs, especially working around other people's memoirs. It's really hard. <laughs> I think I did lose sight of it often. It's, it's really a challenge, right? Like if you work like eight hours and commute, um, you know, you don't have a lot of time left for your own work after that. So I, I, you know, in a lot of ways it slowed me down. Um, but, you know, like working, for example, on Douglas's memoir was very inspiring um, just to see kind of the life that he had lived um, and the sort of possibilities for, for living a life. So it depended, right? <laughs> Thank you for your question, Jasmine. Uh, we also have a question from Lada. She asked, uh, is protesting taken more seriously in France than in the United States? I get the vibe that protesting is like an everyday activity in France. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, I mean, certainly that's a perception we, we have. Um, uh, I would have to think more about how to answer that. Um, yeah, I would have to think more about how to answer that. And, I, and I'll admit, I'm not an expert in contemporary France. So I, I couldn't tell you much about what happens after the 1980s. But you know, certainly it's been interesting to see like the yellow vest protests and compare them to um, the different kinds of formations that we have here and in other places in the world. Um, certainly I think it's, there, there's sort of like a, a, maybe like a dignity to it <laughs> uh, that, that maybe is hard for at least people from the US to understand. Awesome, thank you for your question, Lada. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, we also have a question from Christopher Garcia. Uh, he wanted to note that uh, he had been in a museum at an art institution last year. He was very surprised to find out that no one knew who Duchamp or Man Ray was. And uh, he wanted to know, uh, if possible, basically, why isn't it being taught now? What is your opinion on that? Huh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think it is generally taught a lot now. I wonder what... Um... I wonder what kind of confluence of circumstances led to that moment. Yeah, I think I mean in an interesting way, like right, if if Dada and the historical avant gardes were institutionalized in the '60s, right, like accepted as the art of the museum, the thing that had previously challenged the museum, it's certainly what the most like eminent uh, art historians, at least in the U.S., like have devoted their careers to. Right, it's taken very seriously. Um, Yes, no, thank you. Actually, Marcos has a follow up on Dada. He wanted to know, uh, was Dada in the 20th century a derivative for the social and artistic response for institutionalized art? Ooh, maybe, maybe uh, we should have a Dada class in the future. <laughs> I'm not sure I could give a quick answer to that, but that's a great question, Marcos. Uh, maybe that'll, that'll come up in our capstone a little bit. And uh, Christopher Garcia is wondering, where is Dada today? Same answer, <laughs> but thank you. Exactly, that's what we all want to know. But thank you so much for these questions. Keep them coming as well. Uh, I had some, you know, some pregame questions for you. Uh, thank you so much for telling us what inspired you. Uh, I could tell from all these experiences that you were culminating a little bit of love for another subject. And as it kept going and going, so did your ideas. And I wanted to ask you, does anything in particular help you get your research ideas or is there a method that you specifically use? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I suppose like in, a, in the big way, it's something that's like important and sticks. Like it's, the, it's kind of what I would call like the bad object, <laughs> like the thing that I don't understand and I don't like for some reason, but feels important and like I need to, figure it out somehow. Um, and so that's like the big picture, like that's what led me to my first project. And that's what led me to my, um, the project that I'm going to kind of, I, I had a National Endowment of the Humanities Summer Institute um, this past summer where I began to look into it. Um, so I th I th yeah, I have to say it's like the things that like help me understand something that I'm uncomfortable with. Uh, but then like once you kind of have that, like, oh my gosh, like you just look, you start reading and you're like, why has no one talked about this? Why has no one talked about this? What is this footnote about? Like, and you start to just 
you know, unravel into a million possible directions, right? And I think a lot of you um, who are are working on your um, your thesis or your culminating undergraduate project, like you know this, like it's just rabbit hole after <laughs> after rabbit hole, um, and you just have to kind of pay attention and and I think like try to cultivate a kind of curiosity. I think that's really important um, and something that maybe we don't do all the time because it's like painful and hard. <laughs> But so they sort of stay curious. No, that's an excellent point, especially when it is one of those things where sometimes the best ideas are formed of like, why does this bother me so much? I should figure it out to see and understand perfectly why I am so bothered in the first place. Uh, I also wanted to ask, uh, I thank you for taking us through like your experience as undergrad. I wanted to know if you could go back, would you pursue this career or have done anything differently? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's a question, isn't it, right? I think about this, you know, I could have had a much more straight path. Um, like if I had realized I wanted to be an art historian, uh, you, you know, I could have majored in it. Um, and I, the school I went to actually had a very good art history program and it might've been a lot simpler um, and easier a path uh, than the one that I took. But I think that I wouldn't be the person, you know, you wouldn't be the person you are and you wouldn't have the kinds of questions and discomforts and curiosities that you have. So I think, you know, like this is, I, this right? This is hindsight for all of us. Like if we knew now, then maybe we do things different but then we wouldn't be where we are now and know that. Um, so no. <laughs> I know, uh, you know, you have to, and I think that this is like the, the thing, right? Like, you know, when you're an undergraduate, you have to be open and be willing to change and make a wrong decision and, you know, learn about yourself. Um, and, you know, to the degree in which we give our, we give, our society gives us space to do that, that's good, but we don't always have a lot of space to do that. And that's really sad and hard. Um, because that's the only way you can learn about yourself and figure out what you might actually be happy doing. I couldn't agree more, you know, the trials make the hero. It's never usually the other way around. Um, and actually on behalf of the Art History Society, we would all like to ask you, because this is something we tend to come up a lot with is, what do you think is the best way for art historians to talk about art with non-art historians? What would be the best way to go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And these have all been great questions. I, I should thank each of you. Um, I think, I think it's, it's interesting because we learn a specialized language. We learn a lot of specialized information that helps us understand something. But ultimately what we want to do is connect and communicate, right? And like, you can connect and communicate with anyone. <laughs> and I think that like when you learn how to talk to your family or whomever um, about art, about something that's meaningful to you, like that, always, if something's meaningful to you, it almost always um, can become meaningful to someone else. But I think also when you have to think about like where, how you're meeting someone, where they're at, what their interests are, how you can sort of welcome them or invite them into the things that you're discovering like that can help you sharpen your own thought and and understand things from a new and useful perspective instead of the ones that are like you know handed down by some art historian right and i think that this speaks to the the skills that we learn that are that we take with us for the rest of our lives, like an ability to look curiously and critically and carefully at all kinds of images. So whether this is, so you can have an aesthetic experience, like which we need, I think, right? Like, oh my gosh. Um, uh, or like when we encounter images that are meant to deceive and confuse us, like we can bring that same skill set of looking critically and carefully. And, um, you know, we can help we can have conversations about that with people, you know, because if we learn how to not just have an opinion, but to really look at an object with someone together and talk about it and, and have that object, that image, whatever it is, triangulate your relationship with someone, like you can change someone's mind, you can help someone see something, you can be changed by that, right? And so I think that it's a really, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think it's a really incredible skill set 
um, that can be political um, and that can also just be like a comfort um, and a way to, you know, like sharing food with someone. <laughs> No, you, you completely answered my question and you answered it in the best way possible. That was very well said, especially with um, how the arts are seen in general. You know, sometimes we need this refresher in, in order to find the best way to talk to people about our passions. And you're right, communication is key, whether it be between fellow artists, within a group, within other disciplines, we really like to foster that communication too. And let's see, I have a couple more questions, let's see. How would you introduce someone to the world of art? Where would you suggest they start? And this would be like your personal starting point. I think you can start anywhere and you just have to find a way to be confident, <laughs> right? Like that's always the trick. I think that people are often like intimidated or they think they don't have the tools or knowledge, but you know, we all do. Like we, um, and the ways in which like, what, where we come from might be different from where we think we're supposed to come from or something like that can open up incredible things. So I think like, yeah, I, this isn't a very useful answer, but I think like the kind of cool thing about art is like, especially visual art, it's right there. You can look at it. Like when I, you know, I know very little about medieval art. Um, and that was when I was in France, my favorite thing to look at was medieval art. And I feel like I just, by seeing the same motifs over and over and over, I started to recognize them. I started to come up with naive theories about why it would be this way and not this way. I, I you know, tested the experiences I could have. Um, and so I think the most important thing to have is just this kind of, you have to just like find this confidence to just look at something. And if you don't understand it to not, think that that reflects badly on you, but to think that this is an opportunity to start understanding it. And if it's good, whatever that means, then it'll open up to you. If it doesn't open up to you, there's a good chance it's just not that interesting. <laughs> no, that's very well said too, especially when we're trying to pursue these different kinds of education or we're just simply looking at a mural on a wall or just graffiti art on the street, anything can strike at us. And actually, let's see, Oh, we have a question in the chat from Ms. Channing. Uh, she'd like to ask, do you have any advice for choosing a master's PhD program? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Channing. Um, so first I'd say like, talk to your mentors, right? Like that's, that's one of the things we're here for is we can help guide that process because it can be a little bit, a little bit opaque. Um, make sure it's what you, you know that it's what you wanna do because the job market's terrible. Um, it's a wonderful job, but know what you're getting into. Um, and for a PhD program, make sure it's funded. Uh, you shouldn't go into debt for a, a, a PhD um, specifically because they get a lot of labor out of you in teaching and, and assistantship and stuff like that. And, um, uh, but beyond that, I think, you know, we all have different circumstances and different things that we want to get out of it. Um, and so, you know, one of the big things, you know, is finding someone there, especially at the PhD level, but I think this is the case at the master's level too, that you want to work with that can help you um, learn about the thing you want to learn about and become, you know, the kind of scholar that can, can do that. So, uh, you know, there are programs that are like the top 10 program or whatever, but it might not be the top 10 program in the specific thing that you're interested in. Um, so I think what's really important is um, finding someone who will be able to support you and mentor you and teach you um, what you want to learn. Um, but for navigating that, like, you know, that's what we're here for to, to, to help to help you figure out how to navigate that. So like never be afraid to to talk to your professors about whatever, to ask them advice. Um. Thank you, thank you so much. And we also have a question from Professor Aguilar. He'd like to ask, what is one thing that you like the most about teaching at Cal State? Oh, that's easy, the students. <laughs> and the people more broadly, but <laughs> yeah, it's, we it's agree, you guys. Man. We agree totally in that. <laughs> Exactly. No, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the people here, without the people behind us, without the people in front of us, our families, our ancestors, our everything, you know, and that we were so grateful that we have this community here 
to share these ideas, to hear your thoughts, your beautiful thoughts, Professor Nicolau, and all the wonderful research you have. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for um, being here with me tonight. This was really, really spectacular. Of course. And again, this is the Art History Society. Thank you for coming out to support us in the arts. Uh, our organization is dedicated to community involvement in the arts and giving opportunities to everyone we can to learn, understand, and pursue them. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, if you want to catch up on more of our events, if you want to see this uh, play out again, we'll be posting it on our WordPress website, which we'll, we'll show on our Facebook and Instagram. And this is a guest, a bi-weekly guest series. So we will be having another guest speaker on Thursday, February 25th, at 6 p.m. Same place, same time, same Zoom. Uh, we'll have more information on that event coming up. But thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate your love and support. And again, we would like to say thank you on behalf of the Art History Society. And thank you so much, Professor Nicolak, for being our first guest of the of the of our Spring Symposium series. It was so My wonderful. Pleasure. To hear I everything. can't wait until the next one. Us too. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Have Bye, a great everyone. night.